prophet of the Lord Jehovah. My prophetic ministry took place in the northern kingdom of Israel. In the years between 750 and 725 B.C., I have been summoned here by the contemporaries who are of the apostolic tradition to share with you brief excerpts from my biography. I was making my way back home from one of my many crusades when as I descended the heights of Mount Tabor, I was suddenly apprehended by a strange and invisible presence. This presence was so mysterious that it was terrifying, but yet fascinating. Although rare, having been there before, I knew I was in the presence of the one who is eternal. His voice came to me riding on the bosom of the wind, and it enveloped me like a whirlwind. He said to me, Hosea, I need to speak with you concerning the infidelity of my people. You remember our contractual agreement that Israel would be my people and I would be her God. Well, Hosea, because of her apostasy, her idolatry, and her immorality, her goodness is as the morning dew which fadeth away. She has ruptured our relationship. She has fractured our friendship. And she has allowed strange gods to encroach upon my domain. <clears throat> As I stood there that day at the foot of Tabor, I didn't say much. What does one say when God is speaking? But he allowed me to slip into an altered state of consciousness. I was there, but yet I wasn't there. In the body or out of the body, God knows. But he carried me on a historical voyage. And he allowed me to see time after time when Israel had vacillated in her faith, crumbled in her commitment, and had lost her loyalty. Listening to his voice, his voice was the voice of one who had experienced excruciating pain. Pain known only to one who's had their love rejected. As I listened to the tone of his testimony, I expected him to say to me, Hosea, I'm going to annihilate Israel. I'm going to annihilate Judah. In fact, I'm going to wipe them from the memory of human history. I prepared for the worst. But you know what he said to me? To my utter amazement, he said, I will, I will save Judah, not by armies or horsemen or, or whip weapons, but I will save Judah by the power of my love. <laughs> I said to God, well, I'm sure the people of Israel and Judah will be delighted to hear that. But God, what am I to do with all this? He said to me, Hosea, I want you to get married. I said, I want you to be my living allegory, my, my liaison between God and man. But I've tuned in to several of your last crusades, and as I listen to you, it's obvious to me that you're not quite ready yet. Oh, you were knowledgeable in theology, you were eloquent in speech, and you were mighty in Scripture. But there was something missing. As I listen to you, Hosea, you have not yet fully comprehended my all-inclusive con concept of salvation. You're still too parochial in your perspective. You're hemmed in by habits. You're confined by customs, trapped by tradition, and jailed by your Judaism. Jose, in order to get you ready, I'm going to send you through the crucibles of domestic difficulty. A marriage, I said? Well, that's not so bad, especially when you have an omnipotent, confident God personally selecting the bride. That's not so bad. Why, just the other day, I was having a conversation with myself, and I said, Prophet, it's time for you to take a wife. And there's this young lady. I've, I've been watching her, and I, I know you've been watching her, but she, she, oh, she comes from a fine, orthodox Jewish background, and, and she's a prophet's child. She'd make a great prophet's wife. And, and, she, and she, she comes to all my crusades, and she helps me hand out Ten Commandment tracts. Oh, she'd make a great prophet's wife. The Lord said to me, Hosea, 
He said, Hosea, I know the young lady that you speak of, and you're right. She will make someone a great wife. But Hosea, she's not the one I have in mind. The girl I have in mind for you, Hosea, she's not out of a prophet's family. She's not orthodox in her belief. In fact, the, the girl I have for you to marry is a pagan prostitute. <laughs> Do I have to tell you how I felt? I cannot begin to describe for you the internal impulses that were conflicting under my skin. A prophet marrying a prostitute? No. No, I'd rather die with dignity than live in disgrace like that. No, I will not dishonor my heritage. I will not disgrace my religion, and I will not betray the people of Judah, and I will not embarrass the prophets of Israel. No, I'd rather die. So I got ready to die. I know the danger of talking to God like that. He holds my very breath. So I stood erect at the foot of Tabor. I closed my eyes. I didn't want to see death coming. Come on, death, get it over with. And I expected at any moment to be run over by death and allow death to dismantle the properties of my body. But after I stood there for several hours, nothing happened. I opened one eye to see if I could see death riding on his tail horse. And if I didn't see death anywhere, I tried to slip away. But before I could take that first step, he said to me, the girl's name is Gomer. I said, boy, who'd want to marry anybody with a name like Gomer? But he said, I want you to marry her. I want you to marry her. I want you to be a, I want you to be a living allegory. I want you to be my go-between, between God and man. But Hosea, wait a minute, hang on. I've been about 100 years since I've done this, so I, I have to look at my uh, notes here a few times, and I get kind of confused. But hang in there. Fourteen? Eight. Do I have to tell? I've already done that already. Okay. I'm going to, so I got ready. I'm going to do that. Yeah, God, do you think you could give me some reasons? What will the prophetic paternity going to say? They're going to turn me out. They'll take, they'll, they'll take away my license. What are the people of Judah going to say? Give me some reasons. God, did you say everything we do were to do to your glory? What glory will you get? What is a glory that will come out of a prophet marrying a prostitute? What is the glory of the sacred having intercourse with the secular? What is the glory? And it was right there where God taught me an invaluable lesson. He said to me, Hosea, I will not submit divine wisdom to the short-sighted scrutiny of human understanding. You're too nearsighted to understand what I'm doing anyway. Hosea, when I first called you to be a prophet, he said to me, we made a pact that I would be the senior partner, and as that senior partner, I reserved the right to make some decisions without your approval. You said, he said to me, you make your decision, and then we'll talk. You see, Hosea, I don't want you to follow me out of anything else but your faith and confidence in me. I say, follow me, and you follow me, not based on how much sense I make, not based on how practical I am. I want you to understand, and I want you to trust my heart when you cannot trace my hand. Make up your mind, and then we'll talk. I said, all right, Lord. I said, all right, God, I'll marry her. Where is she? You say she's up at the temple. And as I made my way towards the temple and discovered 
that I was walking in the path of obedience, it was only then that God began to shed light on my understanding. He walked with me, and he said to me, Hosea, now that you've made up your mind to obey me, let me share with you a little bit about what this is about. I want to use this improbable relationship of a prophet and a prostitute to dramatize to sinful, fallen humanity that God loves the unlovable. I want to use you and Gomer to demonstrate to all the Gomers of the history the male and the female gomers who have prostituted themselves, that that no man can fall so low that he falls outside of the reach of God. You may break God's heart, but you can never break his love. His love is relentless. It will follow you to the hog pens of this world because he loves you that much. Now, some of you have been pretty hard on my wife, Sister Gomer. But let me tell you something. The girl tried. I was there. She, she tried, I tell you. She really tried. She came home one day. I've been married for just a couple months. And she said, look here. Look here what I have, honey. Look what I have. She had some new dresses with longer hems. The girl tried. She said, look here. I have some new rouge and lipstick. She tried, I tell you, she got a new hairdo. She said, when I go down to the village, I don't go with my old friends anymore. I try to find some new friends. But she was caught by the pull, the wilds of her old life, her pre-prophetic life. I assumed I was part of the problem because when I went to that day, I went up to get her at the temple to meet her. I called out. I didn't go in. I sent somebody in. And they brought her out, and I said, listen, girl, God told me, you're going to, I've got to marry you, but you're going to have to change your ways. And you need to make a solemn commitment and to, a commitment to me and to me only. I helped her make that commitment, but I never helped her make a commitment to God. When times got hard, her commitment to me was not strong enough. She was caught by that terrible pull. But not only was there was a pull, But there was a push. Some of those folks in those synagogues, they remind those of us who are part of that great cloud of witnesses. They remind us of some of you in the church today. So hypocritical, so cynical, so self-righteous. But some of those folks, they were like that. They would never let my wife forget what she used to be. She'd say every time she walked down the road, some of those synagogue folk, they would say, There goes that old, and you know what they called her. She came home one day in tears, and she said, Hosea, if that's what your God and your religion is like, I don't want it. I need somebody who will forgive me for what I've done and embrace me to have a better future than I've had in the past. And that those of you that are here today need to remember something. And that is that Gomer is kinfolk. Not only is she related to me, but she's related to you because the blood of Adam, the blood that run in Gomer's veins is the blood of Adam. And the blood of Adam is the blood of all men. Your Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Your Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Your sin might not be the sin of my wife, but your sin stinks in the nostrils of God. Kinfolk. We're all part of the unlovable crowd. I remember when it started happening. Whenever you drift away from God, it never happens all at once. It's bit by bit, little by little. In your day to day, you would say it's not a blowout. It's just a real slow leak. The first time it happened, she stayed out all night. The next time it happened, she stayed gone for three whole days. The next time it happened, she stayed gone for a whole week. The next time she left, she just never came back home. She was gone for almost a year when I finally decided to go back up to Mount Tabor. I needed to have a talk with God. And when I got there, 
God was waiting for me. I wanted to get mine in first. I wanted to say, I told you she was going to go and do this. God said, hush, Hosea. Sit down. Where's Gomer? I said, I don't know where she's at. You're God. You ought to tell me where she's at. Gomer, he said, Gomer, how do you, he said, Hosea, how do you feel about her? How do I feel about who? He said, how do you feel about Gomer? I said, the one that's embarrassing me in front of the prophets? He said, yes, how do you feel about her? I said, you mean the one I've been teased about all over the nation? Yes, how do you feel about her? Is anybody here besides you and myself? No, we're alone. I still love her. You still love her? Even though she's done what she's done to you, I still love her. He said, come here. You're ready now to represent me. If you can love Gomer in spite of what she's done, go tell Israel. Tell Israel, although she's played the part of the harlot, Tell Israel, my people, although she's whored after false gods, tell Israel that God says he doesn't want a divorce. He wants reconciliation. Tell Israel, tell her I still love her. Man, you should have seen me getting down off that mountain. I was running, falling, and slipping, and sliding, and, 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 and falling. And finally, I hit rock bottom. And just as I got ready to take off, he said, one more thing. I said, what now, Lord? He said, I need to remind you that not only am I concerned about the Gomers of this world, but I'm also concerned about the Hoseas of this world. I said, you're concerned about me? Hey, I'm the victim here. Have you forgotten? He said to me, he said to me, just like I have to forgive Gomer, I have to forgive you because I have to teach you those of you who have been forgiven, I need, I need to teach you how to forgive. Because you see in my day, you see in my day, us Jews, we believed in an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I had a strange love-hate relationship with the girl. I loved her, but I hated her. I hated her with the perfect hate. It went from the crown of her head to the soles of her feet. I wanted to love her and embrace her. But at the same time, I wanted to get even. God said, Hosea, when I called you to be a prophet, I forgave you. Now I want you to forgive Gomer. Some of you fall into that category. You say you love God whom you've never seen. But you hate your brother you see every day. God says that's a lie. You're living a lie. You're pretending. He said, uh, go tell a story. I went everywhere I could telling the story. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. They're, ca they're calling me. My furlough is almost over. I'll be there in a minute. Just let me finish my story. Well, the years had passed. I hadn't seen or heard anything from Gomer in years. I raised the children all by myself. <clears throat> but one day... I was out behind the house. I was out there pulling corn. And I seen the silhouette of a man standing up by where we lived. And he was hollering at me and waving at me, Hosea, Hosea. I tied a knot in my sack. I throw it over my shoulder and begin to elbow my way up through the stalks of corn. And when I got there, he said, Hosea, I don't know what you want to do with this information. But I just came from the marketplace and I think you ought to know. I'm pretty sure i just seen your wife. She doesn't look like she used to look. The years of sin have stripped her of her beauty. But as I got closer, I could see a resemblance in her face. I'm pretty sure your wife is on the auction block in the marketplace. I went to my room. I got down on my knees. I said, God, what do you want me to do now? He said, I thought you said you loved her. I said, I do. He said, well, you can't stop now. You just won't go all the way. So I got up and I put on my prophetic garment and I began to make my way through the streets of Judah. And I realized that as I walked, not only 
But that, that man tell me, he told everybody else in the community. They were standing at every crossroad waiting to see what I would do. And as I passed, they whispered one to another, there goes Hosea. He's on his way to shake his vindictive finger in the face of his unfaithful wife. But they didn't know my heart. I'd pass another and they'd say, there goes Hosea. He's on his way to have the last laugh. But they didn't know my heart. Finally, I reached the marketplace and as I turned a corner, I seen him, the men and the women up on the auction block. And there was my beloved wife standing up there without any clothes. They'd stripped her of her dignity and everything that gives us worth and value. And I got closer to the crowd. I heard the auctioneer say, we have a woman here. Her name is Gomer. Anybody willing to pay the price? And as I got closer, I had to suffer the indignity of other men bidding on my wife. One man said four shekels, another five, and six, and seven. I got into bidding war at nine, ten, and eleven. And I looked to see what all I had. I said, 15 shekels and a barley and a half. Auctioneer said, sold to the highest bidder. And I went up and I pulled her down off the steps. And I wrapped my robe around her because she had no clothes. And as we left the marketplace, she fell prostrate on her face. And she said, thank you. Thank you, Hosea. Thank you for paying the price for me. I don't deserve what you've done for me. I'll be your slave for the rest of my life. I got down beside her. I said, I don't need a slave. What I need is a wife. The children don't need a slave. What they need is a mother. And I tell you, we went home and we had a good life because of what God did in both of our hearts. But I must close. But that's just a preliminary to the message. And here's the message. If you think my story's something, that's just a forerunner to the story that God talks about. How much he loves you and people like you. So much so that when man sinned, God called a summit meeting and he talked about what he's going to do since man had sinned. And Justice stood up and said, let the wages of sin be death. But Jesus said, yes, let the wages of sin be death, but let the gift of God be eternal life, and I'll be that gift. Justice, go down to Calvary and wait for me. Jesus and, and, and Justice went down and sat on Calvary, and Jesus took the long way around. He come down through 42 generations, and as he passed, Job says, I see him. He looks like a horse pulling in the valley. Ezekiel said, he said, I see him. He looks like a wheel in the middle of a wheel. Amos says, I see him. He looks like a plumb line. Daniel says, I see him. He looks like a rock hewed out of the side of the mountain. And justice, justice got up to slay man. Somebody said, hold on, justice. Here he comes. He's coming up Calvary. He's got a cross on his back. And when he got there, he gave his hands to the nails. He gave his feet to the rivets. He gave his brow to the thorns. He gave his back to the splinters. He gave his mother to John, his spirit to the father. And he cried, it is finished. He bowed his head in the locks of his shoulder. And gave up the ghost. But that's not the end of the story. They laid him in a borrowed tomb. And on Sunday, God moved to make the last move. He raised Jesus from the dead. And Jesus said, all power is given to me is in my hands. Somebody said, what are you going to do with that power, Jesus? He said, I'm going to put it behind my church. Go tell the lost gomers of this world that I still love them. Go tell them that the price has been paid. They can be free from the bonds of sin. And that's my story that points you to the love of Jesus. I have to go. <laughs>